The world has a history of money, whether it's backed by gold or not, where government gets themselves excessively into debt and they devalue the money. So the Romans used to clip the edge off the coins so there was less gold in each coin. And eventually people would lose faith in the coins because they blend them with silver and then blend them with copper. And, you know, the coins were worthless because that was supposed to be worth the value of the of the denarii in Roman times. But governments can't help themselves. Humans, we're just humans, right? Humans are fundamentally flawed creatures and we always will be. So then we have these gold standards, you know, the US and the UK are on gold standards, World War I, World War II, we all have to leave it because we've got too much in debt again. We've overly financialized yet again because humans love leverage above all things. It's kind of sex and leverage are the two things that drive humans for some reason. Then we adopt a new system, which has been around before, but it keeps getting abandoned called fiat money. Fiat money is money not backed by anything. It's backed by the promise of the central bank paying it. So that's the dollar bill that we all are familiar with. And every country in the world now adopted fiat currency. But as with everything, if you're really thirsty and I gave you a bottle of water or sold it to you, you'd probably pay me 10 times too much for that bottle of water. If I give you a million bottles of water, they're worth precisely zero to you. So scarcity has value. That's art, that's cars, that's almost anything. Um, humans value scarcity for whatever reason we do. And so if you're printing too much money, you're creating less scarcity. So yes, there's money everywhere, but the money has less value. So once you understand that, you say, well, what does it mean? The dollar hasn't collapsed. It's kind of where it was versus the euro in the last five years or whatever it is. And then you say, huh, but my $50,000 salary now can buy me much less shares in Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. In fact, units of the S&P 500, I, I suddenly can't buy as much. Since 2008, it's a fraction. I can buy like a third of what I could. Same with real estate, same with gold. And then you're like, huh, assets have suddenly got expensive. They haven't. The value of your savings has gone down or your money. So you can't afford to buy assets. What is an asset? An asset is deferred consumption from the future. I buy a house, I sell it in the future, I get to retire, whatever the, the, the things are, right? We don't buy the S&P because we want to hang it up in our wall. We buy it because we want to sell it at a future date to realize money. So that means our future selves are now poorer. That's essentially what this means. That's what currency debasement is. So Bitcoin comes along in 2008, in the middle of the crisis. It's kind of like it was perfectly prepared for this and said, Satoshi goes, hey, look at this. I can create an algorithm that only creates so much of this thing, the Bitcoin, and it can never vary, ever. So therefore, this is scarcity that humans can't fuck around with. Now, humans have this propensity to fuck around with scarcity because they're economically incentivized to do so. Here they can't. So then they become economically incentivized to own this asset because it's scarce and it cannot be changed because it has this consistent supply curve and a limited number. So Bitcoin becomes this great store of value. And it would look like gold because gold's a good store of value. It's worked for thousands of years. But Bitcoin has this other thing to it. It's a network, which gold isn't. And it's technology, which gold isn't. So we have use cases and the benefits of building a network. So suddenly it goes up exponentially in price. Roll on to 2015 and suddenly somebody's looking at the blockchain and they start saying, imagine if these bits on the blockchain, which is where you record the ownership of something, in Bitcoin, it's Bitcoin itself. What happens if we could put a contract in there? Because humans live off contracts. You know, everything is basically a contract in, in our legal terms. And that was the rise of Ethereum. It became a platform where you could programmably change the blockchain, not the attributes of the blockchain. You couldn't remove anything off that ledger, but you could change the little holding buckets and say, well, it can look like this, it can look like that, it can adopt to this. And those things were verifiable as well. So they couldn't change. So this created Ethereum, which became the platform. So if you think of Bitcoin as this store of value, this very pristine, beautiful thing, then you think of Ethereum as also a very beautiful thing, but it's a much broader application because it's like programmable money.